other than me. You know, we, we live in an amazing time. Uh, Kevin, playing the drums, has also got his little laptop up there, and he is running the sound from the back there. Not, hang on, it's not connected in any way, just by a, a little laptop that's got no strings attached to it. But while he's up there and he's fiddling with that laptop, that machine that's over there, the things are going up and down. <laughs> Amazing. And a man can do that. How much more can God do? Hey, if man's brain can do that, how much more can God do with our lives and redirecting us and challenging us? Fancy Nancy, come over here. I just want you to be here for a minute. Get your hand off my page. <laughs> Put it on my heart. Is it beating? <laughs> Am I alive and well? <laughs> In 1977, an uneducated young man and his wife and children came to the Sunshine Coast to plant a church. Had no idea, hadn't been to Bible school, Scared stiff, no great expectation. I thought if we could build a small church for Jesus, that would be fantastic. I want to title this message this morning, But God. But God. But. That. <laughs> Good. <laughs> All we knew was to sing, preach, and pray for the people. That's all we knew. Sing, preach, pray for the people. The singing wasn't too good. The preaching was even worse. But God. God was good. And he is good. And we've been singing about a good God. People began to come, not for the singing, not for the preaching, but for the presence of God. <laughs> people began to get saved. People began to get healed. People began to get delivered. The church grew to over... A thousand people, but God. So, Father, we thank you for the rest of this journey that we're on. We thank you, Father, that your presence is more than enough. We thank you for the victory of the cross of Calvary. And, Father, we thank you today that your hand is outstretched towards your people and you will build your church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And you will give us the keys of the kingdom, and you'll give us power to bind things on this planet and to loose things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. Nancy's going to run up now to Children's Church. Amen. <laughs> Thanks, Nancy. Give Nancy a big applause. Thank you. I picked this up. And uh, I wanted to read it, uh, some parts of it anyhow, but I couldn't find it. And I suppose, you know, this morning we are down. How many people know that we are down a lot of people this morning? <laughs> and it's easy to get discouraged. And you know that? But I'm not discouraged this morning because I know that God's got a plan for us. Amen? And uh, I, I picked this up a long time ago, and it was written by a young man by the name of Mark Furler. Uh, he was a journalist, a journalism student at the Queensland Institute, Institute of Technology. He was a young man going through college. He interviewed me apparently and he wrote this and he sent it to me a long, long time ago. It's that, I can't hardly see the printing on it, it's faded that much as you can see. But I'm going to endeavour to read a little bit of this. This is what he wrote, turning to Christ transformed 
Pastor Neil Myers from a heavy drinker, larrikin, to a dynamic evangelist and pastor of a Sunshine Coast's largest church. Pastor Myers of Wombai Christian Outreach Centre says Jesus Christ has changed his whole character. Before he explained, he was just an average Australian male and accordingly made regular visits to the pub. I was a bit of a wild fellow, he confessed. I drank as a young person and very early I was into everything. I did not enjoy drinking, but he said, but I just drank to get drunk. Uh, falling, failing miserably at school, Pastor Myers left at the age of 14 to become an apprentice carpenter. Uh, I was always striving, he said. I was striving for fame and fortune. At 21, he had his own real estate agency and building company, but still lacked fulfillment and, and the complete happiness, he said. Pastor Myers and his wife, uh, Nancy Myers, had a retarded son, Rodney, who changed their lives. Our son had epileptic fits and nearly died many times, he said. Pastor Myers said the situation caused such heartache with his wife finally having a nervous breakdown. Nancy Myers was treated for about a month and there was no hope, he said. My marriage was falling to pieces. So they went to church and accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. After becoming a Christian, Pastor Myers said his wife uh, recovered shortly thereafter from her nervous breakdown, both enjoying happy married life. Um, at this time that this letter was written, Jody was 12 years of age. I just want to go to the back page. It, uh, Pastor Myers does not attribute his church and his family success to his own ability. However, I have come out of nothing. And it's only because God has anointed me that I am successful, he said. If he took his anointing off me, I'd be nothing again. Father, I just pray today that you'd help us to understand more about you and less about us. Lord, you are building your church that the gates of hate will not prevail against. You have a purpose and a plan. And Lord, we know today that we are made from the dust of the earth and from dust we will return. But Lord, there's a part of us, the real us, the inner man, the spirit person, per person that you touched and ignited with your presence, the part of us that will live forever and ever and ever and ever. Though the enemy rages and he comes like a storm, though he would come and attack to destroy like a ravishing wolf, though he would come to bring destruction, and as we look around, we see destruction around our lives. Father, there's a part of us that's going to live forever. And I thank you today, my Jesus, that you are our Lord and Savior. And Lord, you want to take us to the heights you want to take us even into a realm of your spirit, Lord, that would eclipse anything that we've ever seen, that would break every mindset in the natural and take us into a realm of the supernatural where your word will be preached with power and with authority, where the enemy's plan will be destroyed in Jesus' name. And we'll give you all the praise and we'll give you all the glory and everybody said... Amen and amen. I believe, friends, with every fiber of my being, like never before, the church needs to see a move of the Spirit of God. Young Mark, as he was writing that, and I worked out it was about 33 years ago that he wrote that article. And he said in that article, he said, except for a few um, wrinkles, and a few grey hairs, 
and a bit of a porch. Well, the porch now has turned into veranda. <laughs> He spoke about carrying the mantle and the anointing of God. He said, we're astounded at the way, wherever he gets his energy from, as he runs across the platform yelling out, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. Friend, I never want to lose that passion. I never want to lose that that which causes us to run across the platform or causes us to lift our hands and in prayer and praise and adoration to the King of Kings. Never want to lose that. Reading the Scriptures and the book of Acts chapter 3 is a story of an amazing transformation that took place in the lives of the disciples. What Jesus did 2,000 years ago, he wants to do again today. And it's not by might and it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And hell will have to freeze over before the word of God will return to him void. Everything that God says he is going to accomplish Everything God says he will do, he will do. Amen. And the enemy will be crushed under our feet. And it will become a footstool in Jesus' mighty name. Not because Neil said it, but because God said it. And God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Has he not said it, will he not bring it to pass? And somehow or other in our frailty of humanity, we've got to change the way we think. We've got to stop thinking small. We've got to stop thinking how the enemy wants us to think. And we've got to start to think the way God wants us to think. Because the way a man thinks in his heart, that's how he will be. And if you can think God, well, then God will be good. And I've spoken these few things in the prefix just so that we could understand that God can take a nothing and make something great and something beautiful. Amen. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but he made something beautiful out of my life. Amen. I, my boast is not in my ability. My boast is in him. My boast is in him. Jesus, after Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, as he was taken, I would imagine, and I can only imagine, as he was taken up, into the presence of every demonic force and every power. Something that was something was happening in the realm of the spirit that man was not conscious of. And I want you to know today that God has never changed. And there are things that are happening today in the realm of the spirit that you and I are not conscious of. And if we allow ourselves just to see what our natural eyes see, you will fail. Because the disciples who had been with Jesus for three and a half years, they'd seen his power and his authority. They'd seen everything about him. But now all of a sudden they see him on a cross. They see them take his limp body from that cross. They, they watch as, he, as he's put into a tomb. And all of a sudden, all hope is gone. And in reality, the disciples backslid. Peter said, I'm going fishing. In other words, what he's saying, I'm going back to my own life. I thought, I hoped, I had hope. But it's not going the way I thought. Friends, I want to tell you this. Not everything will go the way you think it should go. Not everything will happen the way you plan it to happen. But know this with assurance. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in those steps. Because he wants to take you into a place, into a place there that would blow your natural mind. 
We've got to be aware that at this time where the disciples were backslidden and away from God in reality, where hopelessness got around their lives, where the enemy poured his fury and his wrath and his negativity, failure, defeat, whatever it might have been, into their lives. He's doing the same to men and women today. God Almighty was doing something in the realm of the Spirit that would blow if we, call, if we could comprehend the height and the length and the depth and the breadth of it. We wouldn't sit in our seats defeated and failures. We would rise up as champions of God. Because God that day won an amazing victory. He destroyed principalities and powers and dominion and might. He walked right through Satan's domain in hell itself. And he just cursed everything that the devil could do. He stripped him of his power and he stripped him of his authority. I'm going to read some scriptures here to explain where the disciples were. And you'll find it in the book of Mark chapter 16. We know these scriptures only too well. We know them and we know them and we know them, but do we know them? Verse 9 of verse 16, it says, Now when he arose early, this is Jesus on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalena, out of whom he cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him. She went and told those who had been with him. Friend, I want to tell you, you can be with Jesus and still miss what he's doing. We need to have the eyes of our understanding open. We need to be able to comprehend and understand that Jesus speaks truth and life. As they mourned and wept. And when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. The disciples who had been with him the disciples who had, had, had say, as we read the Scriptures, who had put their head on his breast. One who said, no, I'll never allow that to happen. All these things, they heard these things, they did not believe. And after that he appeared to others, other form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, and they did not believe them either. Later. I believe that we're in the latter times. I believe that the church has gone through a time of backslidden state, if I can say it like this. Because our expectations and our thinking most surely hasn't, it hasn't happened the way we think. But I want to say this, as sure as God is God, He is going to have the last say. And He is going to raise up a people from the ashes. We've been singing today, and quite a few of those songs today, we're talking about out of the ashes. Out of the ashes. Out of what looks like nothing. Nothing. And I want to tell you, friends, there might be a lot of people here today like me that are nothings. But if you allow the Holy Ghost to get on your life, He will do something dynamic and powerful more than you could ever imagine or think. Later, He appeared to them, to the eleven. I believe that Jesus is going to reveal Himself in an amazing way. I believe that God wants to show Himself again to the church. I believe he's going to display his authority and his power. He's going to manifest himself that our eyes would be upon him. Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table and he rebuked their unbelief and their hardness of heart. 
I honestly believe that the church is in for a visitation. And when he comes, he's going to come in power and authority. And he will rebuke our unbelief and the hardness of our hearts. Because man has turned the whole table and it's all about self. It's all about me. It's all about my. It's all about what I can get. Because they did not believe those who had been seen after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. Friend, I want to tell you, it's time to be called amongst those that are believers. Amen. It's time to believe again. It's time to trust again. It's time to push through the crud. It's time to push through the barriers and the walls of negativity and failure and defeat. It's time to put past those things that we haven't seen. Because, friend, I want to tell you, I, I, we built a church back 40 years ago, and it was a lot different to what it is today. Because people today, all they're looking for is itching ears. All they're looking for is somebody that will bless them, somebody that will pat them on the back. Well, I want to tell you, friends, when God comes, He's going to come with a stir. He's going to come with a shout. He's going to come with conviction. He's going to come with power. And He's going to come with authority. And He's going to rebuke the unbelief and the hardness of our hearts in Jesus' name. These signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They'll take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will so by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then, everybody say, so then, after the Lord had spoken to them, and he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God, and they, they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. I want to tell you, friends, God is searching for a people. He is looking for a people that will stand up and, and go and, and start to even do things there. And, and man, I want to tell you, when you start to move in God, when you start to do things, when we came up here, I want to be honest with you, I was terrified. Because I knew my lack. But what I didn't understand at that moment of time was God's sufficiency. And if you can rise up and start to declare things, you will change. Something was happening in the realm of the Spirit that the disciples were not aware of. I want to say it again. Things that were hidden at that time. I want to tell you there are things happening right now in the realm of the Spirit that we, the church, are not fully aware of. We know, we know, <laughs> we know something's happening, amen? Can I hear an amen? How many people know something is happening? Something is happening. We know that, but what it is entirely, we do not really know. You must know this. I am not the same person before I got born again. I am not that man. I'm a different man, amen. I'm a different man. In communion, we were talking to this morning about we're new creatures. Old things are passed away. There's some things we've got to let die. There's some things there that we've got to let go of so God can do that creative work inside us. We are not the same as before. But we've been filled also with the Holy, with the mighty Holy Spirit. Born again, transformed, new creatures, empowered, whatever you want to call it. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead now dwells in me. 
And sometimes because of our humanity, frail humanity, when we start saying some things that God wants to do, we sort of think and we, we've got this thing called false humility. Oh, that was Jesus. Oh, that was Jesus. And he was God. But I'm nobody. You couldn't do that for me. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead now dwells in me, whether you believe it or not. But let's put it down this way then. The same spirit that empowered the disciples who were fishermen, ordinary people just like you and me, the same spirit that empowered them that got so full of the Holy Ghost that Peter's shadow, when it touched people, they got healed. The same spirit that was on the disciples is in me. Amen. Can you take that one then? Can you accept that? The same spirit is now in me. But the world just keeps going on, oblivious to, to what God is preparing to do on planet Earth. I want you to just think of this for a moment. What God is preparing to do on planet Earth. That's got to excite the prophetic people. That's got to excite people that are, that are, that are spiritually minded. That's got to excite people that are, that are anticipating with excitement and with enthusiasm that will stir us again. Amen. The world just keeps on going, oblivious. I believe that God is about to rumble. God is about to rumble. I watched that movie, The Cross and the Switchblade, a long time ago, and the gangs used to have what they call rumbles. I want to tell you, God's about to rumble. Amen. Shakabundum. That'll get your hips gyrating. That'll get your feet dancing. Amen. That'll put a sparkle in your eye. There's some things that you and I got to realize. Because you see, we've all been tarred with the same brush. We've all got this body of flesh, stinking flesh. Flesh that wants, wants recognition, wants, wants, wants. It wants, and it wants, and it wants. And you know what I've found about the flesh? It is never satisfied. You go into the fridge, and you say, I'll have a piece of chocolate. <laughs> but it's never satisfied. How we don't get frostbite, I don't know. <laughs> Just go back until all you hear is a crumpling of the empty packet. The flesh. So there's some things that have got to sort of get rearranged. Priorities. What, what, is, what is important and what's not important. The early church realized early that they didn't need a lot of things that people were demanding. And as a pastor, one of the hardest things to be able to do is to be able to separate what people want and what God wants. 
And a lot of churches, and me included, have fallen victim trying to please people. I said in the beginning of this meeting, all that Nancy and I knew to do was sing, preach, and pray for people. Guess what we do today? Sing, preach, pray for people. Because that's all I know to do. <laughs> sing, preach, pray for people. Lay hands on people. Impart into people. Do whatever's got to be done. But they understood that they just didn't need good doctrine, sound teaching, but they also needed the power of God. I believe we need all three. I'm not trying to take away from any, but if all I want is good teaching and I just go after good teaching and I don't really, not really concerned about the power of God, you're in trouble. I believe we need all three. The disciples knew it was more than talking to change the minds of man. It makes it makes it takes a demonstration of God's power to change man. You can have a lot of head knowledge. People will knock on your door and they want to argue scripture with you. This is when you really need the word of knowledge. It's when you really need the power of God operating in your life. When you really need what to say to these people. People looking for a church with good teaching, if that's all you want, Your ears tickle, whatever it might be, you're in trouble. Because you see, sooner or later, they're going to teach on something that you don't agree with. Sooner or later, they're going to bring up that dirty word, tithing. <laughs> they're going to talk about surrender, sacrifice. They're certainly going to talk about something that you don't agree with. And guess what? You're on the run again looking for the church with good teaching. We all need anointed teaching. I believe in anointed teaching, amen, that will stir us to the point we get up off our blessed assurance and do something. Because it seems right, it doesn't mean it is right. The church speaks to itself. What I'm saying is, the church speaks to people what they want to hear. Nice. Nice. I don't know how much nice we have here. Nice. Make you feel good. I've often said, I want to be a burr in your undies. A burr. Because when you start to rest and settle, <laughs> because it seems right, doesn't mean it's right. You see, the disciples 
The disciples, they, in Acts, in, uh, Acts chapter 3, totally transformed, started to do things that were amazing. The lives were, were just changed. They go to the gate beautiful and they find this man. He'd been lame there all his life. And they, and they started to speak words. You've got to remember that these were the, the fishermen and the tax collectors and the people there that were, were in a backslidden state not believing what they heard, not believing when, 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 a, when the woman came and said, he's alive, I've seen him, not believing when the other two disciples that were on their way home came back and said, he's appeared to us. They didn't believe it. But they've got the power of God on their lives. And they walk up to this man and, and, they, and they say, Silver and gold I do not have, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus of Nazareth and the power of God. Friend, we, the church, need the power of God. And the power of God was manifested in, in that man's life and, and we know that it was totally restored, but we know that the religious leaders got angry. And they started, they started to speak. And as the, as the people uh, ran and as they ran towards Peter and John and as, as the disciples perceived that, that they were looking at them in, in a strange way, they said, hey, don't look at us as if by any means this, this great miracle was done by our ability. But this was Jesus the Christ who has been crucified. It's through His name that this was done, this great miracle. And with the miracle power of Jesus and the manifestation of God, 5,000 people got born again. But the religious people were angry. They were cranky. They didn't like it and they tried to stop them. And, P and even the Peter and John that were beaten and they were uh, told never to speak in that name again. Don't you dare speak in that name again. And it says there that they, after they'd been threatened and that, they went back to their own group and they, they gathered the group together and they started to speak. Behold their threatenings and what they're planning to do. They start to cry out to God. Friend, if ever there's a time we need to cry out to God, is this hour that we're living in. The news is, is one after the other, just bad things happening to good people. And they cried this cry out, understanding that it's obvious that the miracle on its own wasn't enough. Or the word of God on its own wasn't enough. We've, we've shared with these people, they've seen the miracle. But my God, we need to see a demonstration of your power. We need to see a move of your anointing over this place. And they said, God... God, will you glorify your son by stretching forth your arm to heal? Friend, today, that has got to be the prayer that comes out of our heart, out of our innermost being. It's got to get around us. It's got to get in us. It's got to get through us. It's got to touch us. Jesus demonstrated the power of God the Father had given him. And his disciples did what he did. They operated at the level. They saw what Jesus did. And unfortunately today, friends, there's been such a, a lack. And, I, and I, I've got to, I'm pointing my finger at myself. I'm not condemning anybody or anything like that. But there has not been the demonstration of power that God expects in His church. Amen. And it's become itching ears. It's been coming this and that, and it's been coming something that God never, ever created. But I want to tell you, friends, things have got to change. Things have got to change. They operated at that level, and if, and if there's a, a lack of that anointing, well, that's where you'll be at. But I want to tell you, friends, if we can rise up, if I can rise up, well, then we will all rise up.
And that's the challenge that's on my life at the moment. Many denominational churches who, are, who started with the blaze of glory and demonstrating the power of God are today in denial. I pray that people will come to this place because they'll see a demonstration of the power of God. I can only take you so far. Bill Johnson can only take you so far. And whoever you're watching on, whoever you, whatever you're watching this on, obviously I haven't got a clue, will only take you so far. It's only Jesus Christ that can take you all the way. Amen. And that's what he wants to do. God's starting to stir people. And if you feel that stirring, you've heard this morning, and you want God to just do something in your life. I see a lot of people that are anchored. Anchored because of something that's happened in the past or something that's sort of brought dissatisfaction. God wants to break those chains so you can move forward. But there's giftings in this room that need to be released. There's passion. No, I want you to just respond to him, not to Neil. I want you just to come out the front and stand in his presence and open yourself again. Dare to open yourself again. There's some people here today that because of her, you've closed the book. You closed the book. And what you're going through is it like an existence. A spiritual existence. God wants to release you. But there are others here today that are just hungry for God and want more. And you just want to open yourself up and say, I want to open myself up for the more. So as we stand to our feet today and as we're singing this song, you just want to come out the front. You just want to come. Just come and stand out here today before God. Stand in the presence of a living God. Let God just get around in your life.